Um, I welcome you all to um, uh, today's presentation. We're here early 9 a.m. and we are going to explore how shared decision-making and informed consent leads to better health outcomes and consumer satisfaction in healthcare and life. Okay, so how can this be done through a trauma-informed lens? This is what Ms. Christina Owens is going to be discussing with us today. And she will be using some examples of maternal and infant mortality and morbidity um, to demonstrate some key points on this topic. Uh, Ms. Christina Owens is a certified professional midwife who is licensed by the Virginia Board of Medicine. Um, she goes by Chrissy, and Chrissy has been working in the maternal child healthcare field since 1998. She has worked in a busy OBGYN office for 10 years in Hampton Roads, as well as a freestanding birth center in Florida. Currently, Chrissy has been attending home births in the area for eight years with offices in Williamsburg and Chesapeake. So please, with a warm welcome, welcome my dogs. Welcome, Christina Owens. I'm going to mute myself and go off the screen. Take it away, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I am so honored to be here. Um, I've had an office in Williamsburg um, near Merchant Square for almost 10 years. Um, and I'm feeling like we're just kind of starting to begin to plug into this wonderful community uh, with different activities. And some of it's just been since COVID. Um, so it's been exciting to see, and this is the first I had heard of this Resilience Week, and I think it's absolutely amazing that you all are putting this together. Um, this is wonderful, and the topics have been fantastic. Um, so let me just preface this with, we are talking about trauma today. Um, so some of the topics might be a little triggering. You may feel that um, this is triggering for you or um, whatnot. So I just want to preface that so that you are aware that there is that possibility. So no one will be offended if you need to step out or mute or leave altogether. And I apologize and feel free to contact me afterwards if you want to talk through some of it. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. So shared decision making and trauma informed healthcare. What the, in the world is this? Um, a lot of people might know a little bit about it, um, but trauma-informed healthcare is becoming not necessarily a new phenomenon, but a more explored topic. It is more popular in some healthcare settings than it is in others. Um, and we may explore some of that today, even if we don't do it until we get to the end with some of your questions. But it's my goal to foster a relatable discussion this morning as we explore some of this. Um, some of us are healthcare providers, so we are aware of some of this. Um, but also all of us are um, clients or patients of somebody out there somewhere in our healthcare and other decision-making aspects of life. Um, so we will briefly overview what each of these are, some trauma-informed care, some self-care, very basic things. Um, and then we can talk more about that after the presentation. So if you have questions, write them down or put them in the chat box so that we make sure we get back to them. So let's start with trauma-informed care or shared decision-making rather, but first let's look at some definitions of what different pieces of this are. Um, informed consent is like the first biggest portion of it. Um, this is Wikipedia's definition of informed consent. Um, so typically you are more talking about a medical procedure, maybe partaking in a research study, or even just disclosing, disclosing your personal health information maybe to another provider that you are seeking care with and a myriad of other scenarios. We use this in our everyday lives as well in a number of areas. Um, but sometimes there's times that this consent is not fully given at all or implied in some areas of medicine. Um, so let's paint a picture here. You go to your primary care doctor for nagging pain, swelling in your knee, not quite sure exactly what's going on. They recommend taking some images like x-rays, CAT scans, whatever, some anti-inflammatory medications, apply ice or heat, uh, maybe some cortisone injections to help with some of the discomfort and pain, and then give you an order for physical therapy. Um, knowing that potentially none of this will work, 
maybe you'll need surgery to repair the injury. Discuss all the risk and benefits of each of those modalities or alternatives. Um, and sometimes that means doing nothing. You decide to try all the suggested therapies, but in the end you consent to surgery because none of it really works. It gives you a little bit of relief, but you really could use more. Um, lots of discussion is now focused on how the procedure is gonna take place, um, including every little detail of what will happen once you arrive at the surgery center, um, what the intake process will be, that they're gonna hook you up to certain monitors to monitor your vital signs and things like that, IV fluids, anesthesia, the whole gambit. You give permission to allow this treatment to take place and surgery is performed, everything's signed, you have a successful surgery and you recover where? well. Excuse me, this is informed consent. And in that scenario, a lot of these things that are principles of informed consent took place. You had the decision-making capacity and comprehension of what the provider was telling you. They gave you all the ins and outs of all the interventions they recommended, the risks of each, benefits, alternatives, including doing nothing. You gave consent without feeling like you were being coerced or forced into making this, the decision that the provider wanted you to make. And then of course they document it and everything. Um, and along with some of this discussion, usually statistics research is brought up for certain procedures um, and you go through all of those. Like sometimes what are the risks of having too much bleeding that can't be controlled during the procedure or accidentally nicking something nearby, you know, all those things are usually discussed. So the next piece of that is informed refusal. This is where language is sometimes very important, that whole refusal sometimes in healthcare and in charting in somebody's healthcare um, chart, whether it be electronic or paper, sometimes can kind of set the scene for other providers to misread that. Um, sometimes that gives the idea that, oh, this is one of those difficult patients um, or they're non-compliant. I do not like that word non-compliant at all. Um, so informed refusal is after taking into consideration all of these facts and implications of the treatment and deciding in the end, you know what? I don't wanna do any of these. Um, I'm just gonna wait and see what happens. I'm gonna do my own thing. Um, this is a joint effort, both of these pieces, and not one-sided. It's important to trust the folks that you are seeking guidance from and with in any aspect of healthcare. Um, and no one should ever be penalized for the decisions they make or made to feel bad. Um, and certain language is definitely a part of that. So as a healthcare system all around, we need to be mindful of the language that we are using when we have these discussions with our patients or clients. So how do they become part of this shared decision-making? The National Academy of Medicine defines it as a process of communication and deliberation, and it's usually evidence-based. So taking in those research pieces, sometimes there isn't great research around certain um, interventions in medicine. Sometimes it's anecdotal. For instance, don't wanna gross anybody out, I work in maternal health care. There is this thing called placenta encapsulation. Folks decide to turn their placenta into a supplement that is taken by capsule by mouth. Um, that research studies aren't great. It's like, does this stuff really work or is it a placebo effect? Um, but most people do describe it as I feel like I have a little bit more energy. I'm less moody. I'm not crying as much. Um, so there's anecdotal um, findings for some things. So one of those funny little things. Um, in 1988, the Pickering Institute coined this term as patient-centered care. They conducted a multi-year research project and identified eight characteristics of care that were most, the most important indicators of quality and safety from the perspective of the patient. Um, clear, high quality information, coordinated and integrated care, respect for the patient's values, preferences and expressed needs, 
um, education for the patient and family, physical comfort, including pain management, emotional support, um, alleviation of fear and anxiety, involvement of family members and friends is appropriate, and then continuity, including through care site transitions, meaning um, if there's several specialties involved that that care is coordinated amongst all of those providers with ease, and then access to care. That's a big one in this country right now is access to care, especially with COVID. The Institute of Medicine coined this patient-centered care and defined it as care that is respectful of and responsive to an individual's preferences, needs, and values. Um, and it should guide all clinical decisions. Um, it highlights the importance of clinicians and patients working together for the best outcomes. And, you know, sometimes outcomes are not equal to what a provider expects to see or wants to see, but based on that patient's decisions, which we've learned sometimes is refusing certain things, that a best outcome for a patient sometimes is more about satisfaction than anything. How did you feel about making these decisions on your care mixed with what the outcome was? Other examples of these decisions that need to be made, we talked about surgery, medication, sometimes it's diagnostic testing. Um, and sometimes patients just wanna avoid the cascade of interventions. Um, for instance, in childbirth, um, some folks are wanting a natural, unmedicated, free to move about as you wish in labor kind of aspect. And knowing that sometimes when you allow a certain intervention, that sometimes that means that it just increases the risk of the next intervention, um, so on and so forth. But the pinnacle of this shared decision-making is at minimum with the patient and the clinician, but can involve family members and their other trusted allies, whether it be a family member, a friend who is helping with their care, plus all the other providers that might be included in this. The most common components involved in the shared decision-making process is clear, accurate, unbiased evidence, which sometimes is hard as a clinician when you've seen particular things that happen over and over and over again to not be biased on, well, that doesn't work. So I'm just not gonna discuss it. Um, it needs to be tailored to each individual. Um, in our practice, um, a lot of our care, all of our care is shared decision-making because we are including our client in every aspect of their care and giving the power back to them to make the decisions. We give them the research, we encourage them to go do their other research, and then we come back and we talk about, what did you find? What do you have questions about? What are your concerns? Let's talk through all of it and make sure that it's tailored to you because what works for one may not work for another. Um, genetic testing is a good example of this. A lot of our clients decline genetic testing because for one, they don't feel they need all that information for two, they feel it's just an added stress to their pregnancy. Um, and three, sometimes it is not gonna change their decisions further on down the road um, as to whether to continue with the pregnancy or not. Um, sometimes it can be helpful in knowing um, whether or not you need to change your venue if where you're planning to give birth. If you were planning to give birth out of the hospital and you find that your baby has a genetic disorder that may need more advanced care, sometimes having that baby in the hospital is going to be the best um, option for that mother and baby. But again, the parents have to come to that decision. We can't make it for them. There's also decision aids that um, are becoming a lovely involvement in healthcare. There's a gambit of decision aids for like cancer treatment and folks with cardiovascular injuries and lots of different things that providers are using. One of the ones that we use a lot in women's health is the brain decision aid. Um, it is benefits, risks, alternatives. Um, what is your intuition telling you? And then next steps. Um, this can be useful in all sorts of things. Um, and another thing that providers are using is clinical practice guidelines. These are different than protocols that folks are used to hearing about, especially in hospitals and whatnot. Um, but these clinical practice guidelines are more of a broad statement. Um, for instance, like a medical society 
might make a statement on how we handle um, hypertension or the international or the American Academy of Pediatrics may have a practice guideline on how they um, may deal with jaundice in newborns kind of thing. Those are just guidelines that folks can then make their protocols from if they choose. Let's see here. And then of course, next steps. Time to think about all the things that you've just discussed and now let's come to a decision. Now, how do these things impact us? Um, we can see here that with this shared decision-making, care is more ethical. You are looking at the person as a whole. Um, it can help bridge health disparities by that continuity of care. Um, you may have somebody who has diabetes, but within diabetes, there's other things that can be um, issues. Um, nerve pain, so you may have pain management, you may have a nutritionist involved, a whole gambit of subspecialties. So that bridging those disparities to work together as a collaborative team can very much impact our health. Um, the quality of care, um, the cost, healthcare dollars, we spend more money in this country on healthcare than most other countries do. And we don't always have better outcomes. Um, so safety is an issue there. When we talk about maternal um, and infant healthcare, our maternal mortality and morbidity rates are horrid in this country. Um, and we're like one of the leading nations in healthcare. Sometimes we don't show it very well. So there's lots of strides that can be made in those aspects. And then finally, patient satisfaction, which sometimes in the end is what matters. Um, sometimes we have to transfer clients in for various reasons. Sometimes it's, usually it's not an emergency um, in labor or immediately postpartum, or if baby's having trouble transitioning after birth, we may need to transfer them into the hospital. And it doesn't necessarily matter that it may have been an emergency or an urgent transfer in if the client is satisfied with the care they received, even though there was an emergency involved, they don't see it as traumatizing, um, which there is a lot of trauma involved in childbirth. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about this. This is just a quote that I saw that I, yeah, it's, this is quite true. Although we can't see folks' mental pain and sometimes it's less dramatic to the observer than the physical pain. You can see when somebody has a broken arm or a broken leg or they're limping because they've had surgery or the whole nine yards there, but it is harder to bear that mental pain sometimes. And when we are talking about traumatic events and trauma in our lives, um, we can put on a good face, put a good foot forward. Sometimes you can't see that this person is struggling mentally, either because of pain or a debilitating illness or from trauma in their lives. So we need to use that as our trauma-informed lens when we interact with each other in our daily lives. So what is trauma? The American Psychological Association defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event. The Oxford Dictionary, very similar, but also includes physical injury. Now, when we are talking about trauma in the healthcare setting, a lot of times um, folks are thinking that physical injury. Um, so when you go to the ER, there's trauma centers. Those are more geared around physical injury. Sometimes we have to read between the lines because trauma sometimes is hard to pinpoint because we learn adaptive measures throughout life, especially when it comes to childhood trauma. This is where it gets a little bit tough to discuss trauma. There's different types of trauma and you can find various categories from different organizations as to how they categorize trauma. So single incident or acute trauma is usually a one-time event like an accident, maybe a severe illness that required hospitalization, um, military combat, a terrorist attack like a bombing or school shooting, natural disasters, uh, being a victim of assault, sometimes even witnessing that assault. Rape is a big one. Losing a loved one can sometimes cause acute trauma. 
um, childbirth is one of those, um, and post-suicide attempts. Sometimes those that survive an attempted suicide, they relive that trauma over and over again. And that leads us to the repeated or complex trauma. Repeated is usually within a relationship, an interpersonal relationship, where one might feel trapped, powerless, coerced to do things that they wouldn't necessarily want to do. Um, we see that a lot in domestic violence, um, emotional, verbal abuse, bullying. Um, sometimes battered women or men, it can go both ways, domestic violence incidents. Um, sometimes that person feels like they can't leave because they fear for their life or the life of their child. If I leave, they may hurt us. The complex trauma occurs usually in the formative early years. We see that more with child abuse, neglect. Sometimes growing up in an overly strict household can cause that kind of trauma. Um, crossover trauma um, encompasses several things, historical, collective, and transgenerational trauma. It can be psychological or emotional difficulties from effects on a particular community or cultural group, or even an entire generation, things like racism and slavery, forcible removal from a family or community, uh, mass casualty, accidents with fatalities, war, genocide. These are all crossover types of trauma. Um, some of these intertwine with each other because sometimes those single incidents um, happen once, but you relive it over and over again until you find help in getting through that trauma. Um, it can also cause um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, vicarious or secondary trauma. This is one that folks don't hear about a whole lot. Um, secondary trauma, sometimes um, compassion fatigue that we'll talk about in a little bit is included in that. Um, have you ever felt traumatized by hearing somebody's story about something they've lived through? Um, do you work with folks who've experienced a lot of trauma? Um, I myself have listened to many, many stories from women about the trauma involved in their previous birth. Sometimes that is why they are seeking my care because they feel they want a more individualized um, approach to where they know who will be there for their birth and they've met them, they've developed a relationship with them. You go to labor and delivery, sometimes you get whoever's on call. It may not be the provider that you've seen the most or maybe it's the provider you didn't click well with and you don't see eye to eye. Kind of thing. Over time, you can suffer some vicarious or secondary trauma from hearing these stories. They break your heart. It's hard not to sit there and cry with these women when they're crying about, I felt so powerless and I felt traumatized. Nobody asked me what I wanted. So in a sense, you're kind of reliving their um, fears and trauma and anxiety all at once. Um, there's this um, term called bystander intervention. Seeing these traumas take place, sometimes it is hard. We witness it, but sometimes it's harder than you think to actually speak up and do something about it in the moment. Because sometimes you're just stunned. You're like, I can't believe I'm seeing this. What do I do? That bystander intervention is becoming a newly explored topic these days. So stay tuned for more of that. Um, and then there's little t trauma that is less discussed, but a part of like everyday life. Sometimes just moving to a new home, changing jobs, losing a job. Um, sometimes the ongoing um, losing of a loved one. We talked about that in that single incident. Sometimes you go through some bereavement trauma in the beginning, but then you know, as Mother Day approach, Mother's Day approaches, sometimes we are mourning the loss of those loved ones that we would spend that time together with in certain holidays and stuff. How can this affect our health? Well, I mean, we have all seen how detrimental the effects of trauma can be on people's lives, especially if they're not finding good coping mechanisms or help. Um, they don't wanna seek help with a counselor because mental health is so taboo in our society rather than it should be celebrated. If you had a heart condition, you would take medicine for it, but people, feel that my brain isn't working as it could, but if I take medicine, people are gonna think I'm you know, less than. It's not true. We need to treat those things just as we would any other condition um, when we're having issues. 
It's typical to experience shock and denial immediately following a traumatic event. And sometimes long-term effects can be unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and physical symptoms like headache or nausea when you think about um, what that made you feel like. Um, they're all normal, but sometimes we have difficulties moving on from these things. Um, there's lots of studies linking past experiences to our current health, physical health, chronic pain, sleep disturbances. Some folks turn to substance use to help drown out the effects of this trauma on their everyday life. Some folks do self-harm. Um, cutting is a stress um, releasing mechanism that sometimes we see in the younger generations. Um, our mental health can struggle. We can develop anxiety, depression, PTSD, have suicide, suicidal ideations because the trauma has affected us so much that we can't possibly think about moving forward. Um, it strains our relationships. We sometimes take up risky behaviors. Um, sometimes it prevents us from leaving abusive relationships. We are, and sometimes job dissatisfaction becomes just this boring mundane thing and um, it just perpetuates lots of things over and over again. So a study was done in 2000, the British National Survey of Psychiatric Morbidity is released every so often. Um, and they look at linking childhood um, and other types of trauma to health conditions um, or just necessarily how do these things intertwine with each other? So Bebbington et al. They did a, they took some of this information from the 2000 British National Survey on psychiatric morbidity, and it looked at childhood sexual abuse and suicide intentions. The study found that 28% of female survivors of childhood sexual abuse attempted suicide later in life. And 7% of male survivors attempted suicide later in life. So these traumas can impact our life expectancy in traumatic ways, in dramatic ways. Um, the biggest item of note is that we can't always tell by looking at someone, like I said before, that they've experienced a traumatic event in their life. Most of us have had some sort of trauma in our life. Sometimes it's just the little T traumas of daily life. And sometimes it's more acute than that or traumatic or we've lived through domestic violence and survived it and gotten away, all sorts of things. But you can't always tell by looking at somebody what their life has been like. This should be the, the framework for trauma-informed care and just life in general. Compassion fatigue. A lot of people don't know that this thing exists. Um, this was taken from compassionfatigue.org. They have their own website. They're doing great things. It's not just a set of, it's a set of symptoms. It's not a disease, um, but it is akin to that secondary trauma, stress, um, PTSD, empathetic distress, vicarious trauma, um, and it can create issues in our lives. Um, Self-care is very important. And some people don't like that term self-care. Um, I like to reframe it sometimes as self-assessment. Um, taking a look at me is not selfish. How am I doing today emotionally and physically and spiritually? And what can I do to help better myself? The origins of compassion fatigue most likely took hold during our formative years. Um, surviving a dysfunctional childhood can create these behaviors and patterns that lead to high levels of compassion fatigue and caregiving. Um, studies show that children who suffer adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, like alcoholism in a parent, physical abuse, mental abuse, um, sometimes even just being neglected, they are at risk for future violent victimization, chronic health conditions, low quality of life, and as we talked earlier, early death. Um, when we are put into a position to care for others at an early age, we learn to put the needs of others before our own. And we can grow up lacking some personal boundaries, experience overdeveloped sense of responsibility and carry some unresolved trauma within. Um, as providers too, we sometimes have to Boundaries, personal boundaries are important. Um, I have to turn off my phone um, for the weekend sometimes and only take calls for 
urgent matters and labor. Um, if you just need to know when your next appointment is, let's wait till Monday to do that. So sometimes we have to set our own personal boundaries so that we don't suffer from compassion fatigue in other ways. And this is true of any type of caregivers, whether it be parents of children or you're taking care of a loved one who is ill or working as a nurse or a doctor or a number of healthcare professionals. Some of the symptoms, as you see here, this can be, these can be symptoms of a lot of things as well. But, you know, if you feel like you are suffering from any of these, then we need to try to get help. We need to try to avoid some of these things and really look internally to what can I do in my day-to-day -day routine to help fix this? Um, sorry, just catching up on my notes. This isn't necessarily the same as burnout, but it can happen quickly. These are the folks that are at risk of becoming overwhelmed um, and suffering some of these compassion fatigue symptoms. Um, if you're new to the field of caregiving, sometimes it's very overwhelming. You can sometimes take on more than you thought and become overwhelmed very quickly. If you have your own personal trauma that you're working through, um, the greater number of clients that you are working with, the more likely you are to come across folks that have trauma in their life and you can experience vicarious trauma that way. Working long hours, um, burning out in other aspects of life, even in work, job dissatisfaction, not having good support, not being able to communicate well um, is another risk factor. Sometimes seeking counseling is good for everyone, especially as care providers um, and caregivers. Everyone should have a good counselor that they can go to to get unbiased, sometimes solicited advice on how to cope with these things. This is what these folks do for a living and they can suffer compassion fatigue too, but that is what they are here for, to help us with these things. Here's some other things that we can do to help this just in the workforce. Um, talk about this, make folks aware of this compassion fatigue in the onboarding process, during orientation, have ongoing trainings so that folks can um, maybe do some internal examination of, ooh, I think I'm having some of these issues. What do I need to do about it? How can we prevent it? How can we treat it? Um, having support groups or resources that you can give to your employees, your coworkers. Um, some larger corporations have wellness programs and employee assistance programs to help with this, um, offering flexible hours and job sharing, and just being okay with once in a while, you just need to take a day off and it's okay. That self-care, that self-awareness, it's very important. You need to take care of you in order to take care of others. And it self-care looks like a lot of different things. Um, there's no silver bullet cure for compassion fatigue. Um, so in 2018, a journal in the Canadian Family Physicians called Trauma-Informed Care, Better Care for Everyone, summarized a lot of the relevant literature there was to compile the principles of what trauma-informed care is. So I'm gonna read you a story that was quoted in that journal. It's about a gentleman named Max. He's a burly tattooed man, visits frequently complaining of pain, claims you're doing nothing for him. When he appears at the office, your heart sinks. Max has two kids, he's very close to one son, and this relationship has motivated him to end his criminal activities. Unfortunately, he has chronic pain that started in his back, spread to his arms and legs, and now is everywhere. No treatment has been effective so far. He's become a loner, experiences anxiety, insomnia, and can't maintain functional relationships. After struggling with his care for months, you finally take the time to ask him about his life. He is surprised as he's never been asked about his upbringing. He was abused as a child, left home at the age of 14, lived on the streets and worked as a laborer before joining street gangs. After this conversation, your rapport changes dramatically and you start to talk about the link between chronic pain and childhood trauma. He's open to this conversation and gradually visits less often, although you still see him regularly. When he visits, you listen to him with care 
And when you discuss the need to wean off the narcotics he's been prescribed, he's willing to participate despite his persistent pain. Now, you both smile when you greet each other and you're surprised to discover that you actually look forward to seeing him. This is that trauma-informed care lens. Um, when somebody comes in with these things that you think, oh, here we go again, that compassion fatigue may set in, like here's a problem patient, why are they back again? Things like that. You have to be aware that what is going on underneath? What is the source of the problem? Um, sometimes just being aware of it and acknowledging it can set a, per a person's whole demeanor in a new direction. Like you actually care. They need to feel safe, safe in your care and that they can, um, that you're trustworthy that this information isn't going to leave the room, that you're not gonna blab about it to everybody else and complain about this particular patient to another provider. Make them feel safe. Um, give the choice control back to the patient and collaborate on their care. What can we do to get to the bottom of this? How can I help you? Um, we do want to try to get to a place of, in his situation, a place of, okay, how can we get it to where we are weaning you off of the pain medication and you're still feeling okay and you can get through your day and you're not relying on this as a coping mechanism. Um, make it a strengths-based and skills building type of care. So build on that person's strengths and build coping skills um, for taking care of themselves and other things. Um, and also being culturally aware, historical, um, trauma and identity, um, how do they identify, um, and using appropriate language in all of those settings, things like that. Maybe even being more aware of their situation. If they are low income, they don't have a lot of resources, um, you're probably not going to tell them that, well, you know, if you just ate more organic food, you would be better. Um, Sometimes that's not appropriate and it's not helpful and it just deters from it. And now they're gonna pull away because they don't feel as safe in your care. Um, and sometimes it's having hard discussions. Um, in our practice, we sometimes have these hard discussions about what is gonna make you feel the safest in your care and in your labor um, that I can help provide, that you can help me provide you what can we do to collaborate to make this a better experience for you? Um, I have one more story to share. Um, and this client has given me permission to share her story. Her first pregnancy ended in a very traumatic cesarean. After um, when her water broke, there was an abruption. This was before she came into care with us. There was an abruption of the placenta. So the placenta started to tear away from the uterus, um, baby's lifeline a very scary emergency. Um, scary emergencies like that don't always have to be traumatic, but in her care, she felt that no one was listening to her, that she was being forced into decisions that she didn't have time to wrap her head around. Um, they had promised her that her husband would be with her the whole time that she was in surgery. Um, of course, this was at the beginning of the pandemic, so everybody's wearing masks and things like that and, and keeping distance. Um, so she is screaming, blood curdling screams as she's being wheeled into the OR because her husband isn't with her, that they had promised that he could be with her. Um, he came in after they had numbed her and everything before they started the procedure, but they were about to start the procedure and he wasn't in the room. Um, thankfully, a nurse heard her and said, hold up, we've got to stop. We've got to go get her husband. Um, but then from that moment forward, she no longer felt safe. She didn't trust the folks around her and she was just itching to get out of the hospital. Um, now we are working through a lot of those things as she is pregnant again to feel more in control of her situation and confident in her choices. Um, sometimes we have to have these hard discussions about, do you know what any of your triggers are? She said, yes, standing on my right side, touching me from behind without announcing yourself. 
typically in our practice, if we're coming in to listen to baby or um, check mom's blood pressure or whatever, we're not announcing ourselves because they know who we are and that we're there in their home. Um, so this is going to be an interesting feat for us because this is out of our norm and out of our comfort level. But for her, we need to make sure that, hey, it's Chrissy. I'm coming in to check on baby. Is that okay? Um, and we always ask permission before we touch a woman, even just to take her blood pressure, um, to listen to her baby through her abdomen. We ask permission. Is it okay if I touch? We have to get that yes before we do it. This is what trauma-informed care can look like. Um, is it okay if I discuss your um, thoughts and feelings with your spouse or your partner? Would you like to bring them to your appointment so that we can all have these discussions so that we can collaborate together and figure out what is going to be the best care for you? Um, individualization, because all individuals, we all have different goals and hopes and dreams. And we should, that should be taken into account in our healthcare because it is part of our well being. Here are some of the references I used for this presentation and my contact information if anyone wants any other information from me or wants to discuss something, I am happy to do that. And thank you so much for being here and going through some of these hard, hard topics to discuss. Thank you. Christina, I'm very happy to have sat through this discussion. I do want to open up the floor now for anyone who might have some questions um, or want some clarity. And I do have something I'd like to be clarified. You mentioned BRAIN as an acronym, uh, specifically in female, mm, I guess, I'm, I'm not sure. I want, I want you to repeat that so that I have that correctly because I thought it was interesting. Okay, it is just a, a tool. The B stands for benefits, the R stands for risks, um, the A is for alternatives, I intuition, and N next steps. It's a tool that can be used for making decisions in care. Like for instance, okay, in our practice, if we've sent somebody to the hospital for whatever reason and the provider is saying, well, let's just break your water kind of thing, going through, okay, what is the benefit of that? What are the risks? Um, are there any alternatives to that? Sometimes you go back through those benefits and risks of all those alternatives. Um, and then, you know, what is, what is your inner self saying? Like, oh, I'd rather wait, or can we hold off and discuss it later? And then kind of what your next steps are going to be. Um, it can be used in all sorts of things, not just women's health. Perfect. No, thank you. That was good. Um, I guess one thing that's on my mind sometimes is how do you begin to create that relationship with a doctor? How do you know that a healthcare provider uh, is willing and interested in in going that route with you? I've uh, you know I'm I'm 36 years old. I've been to the doctor you know standardly for uh, you know my life, um, and I've only met one one doctor of all the doctors I've been through in all the places I've lived um, that. Uh, this is just general practice where you kind of just go in for your checkup and your regular blood work um, that really wanted to know everything about me, really asked questions from mental health to social health to uh, family background as a personal interview kind of before, you know, even just looking in my ear or checking my heart. Um, and I was confused but impressed at the same time. Like as I was sitting through that process, I was like, ah, oh, this, this, this feels good and this makes sense. And this is the first time this is happening. This is weird. This is taking forever. All those things went through my brain. But I, but then in the end, when you left, I was just like, that's the first time anyone has ever, a doctor specifically, yes. has ever, I've ever felt like they cared that much <laughs> or they thought that that was necessary for what they do. But, um, and I guess from, from that point on, I've always been thinking as I grow uh, into my work as a, as a service provider, how, how do I, how do I get that doctor to be on my side like that? Because it is, it's beneficial, you know, and um, and unfortunately, not all, not all healthcare providers have that type of mentality or maybe that time or maybe that, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, and so I, can say, I wonder what I can do to kind of help bring that out of my provider. Yeah. 
Sometimes um, you peruse and see if you can find information about them before you go in, see if they've written any journals or articles or anything done, you know, been part of research, things like that. And sometimes you know, I like to tell folks that like when we do consultations for folks that are interested in our care, they're free. It's a two way interview. Um, your doctor is your employee in that time. And we need to feel more comfortable with asking some of those questions. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, it's left to us to start those conversations of like, I feel you need to be aware of this is what my upbringing was and what my childhood is and any past traumas and things like that. Because sometimes they aren't aware enough to ask those things, or maybe they're rushed that day. Um, and you know, some providers are better at these conversations than others. And sometimes that's, you go through this interview process with them and it might take two or three or four providers before you're like, okay, I'm comfortable with you because I didn't even have to start that conversation, you did. Um, I'm hoping that as this becomes more of a talked about thing, that this will just become part of healthcare innately, that everybody will be having these discussions. Um, Sometimes it's just uh, healthcare, they're overworked and underpaid sometimes. They don't have the time or they are allowing themselves to take on more than they can, um, more than they can do. We limit our practice because we know that after a certain number of clients in one day, you know, you get tired, you know, it's like, do I really need to ask this question again? We've had this conversation before, but you still need to look at each person individually and what their care needs to be for that person. So sometimes it is really hard to weed out those providers that are not interested in having those discussions or just want to, you know, move forward business as usual kind of thing. Yep. 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 Here's all we checked all the boxes. You can go now kind of thing. And, you know, you shouldn't be spending five minutes with a care provider, especially on a first visit. Um, and I mean, and it's good to note also that our insurance companies are connected to our providers. And so I do specifically, you know, with this one gentleman who I thought was very intuitive and uh, interested in knowing my whole history, um, he wasn't supported in my network and my insurance and I had to leave him. So, you know, that's something to point out too, that the options are limited. Yes. Sometimes that's yeah. a whole nother soapbox is the a whole nother thing. thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll try not to go there if I can help it, but yes, <laughs> I, I, in this country, insurance does unfortunately rule a lot of our healthcare and our choices. And that's where that access to care becomes difficult for a lot of folks. Um, yeah. You find a great provider and it's like, well, either I can pay out of pocket for great care, but I can't afford to do that. So now I have to, um, go to somebody who's just a little bit less than ideal for me and hope that I get the care I need. And sometimes I'm going to have to do some of the work for them. Um, and it shouldn't have to be that way, but that's just the way our healthcare system and insurance goes. Unfortunately, we see that a lot in our practice too, because a lot of insurance companies are not in this state are not paying for, um, out of network providers at all, or they won't cover out of hospital birth and midwives, um, even though there's lots of research to back up um, good outcomes and things of that nature. They just, in this state, it's not a requirement. In other states it is. So it's an interesting battle. Chrissy, can you tell me again, um, I do like the tool for decision-making, the brain. So you had benefits, risk, what does the A stand for again? Alternatives. Alternatives and the I? Intuition. Thank you. Great. I had all of them except for um, alternatives. Thank you. I think that's uh, really good. You know, we do um, a lot of decision making um, when it comes to our adult services and our adult protective services um, because of, um, you know, they have rights and um, we may not always agree with how that um how they make a decision, but I like that, how it could, you know, what you use for it in your world, how I can take that and use it for other aspects of it. So I really like that. So thank you, Sherry, for bringing that up because um, I didn't catch it the first time around. So thanks. You're welcome. It can be adapted for just about any situation in life. Um, I think sometimes it's a good tool to teach our children too, on how yeah. to make decisions in life. Um, I always told my girls when they would go off with their friends, make good decisions. Um, 
so that they would think about the things that they might encounter and do. And, you know, the people around them may not always be making good decisions. That doesn't mean that they can't. Um, can you say anything about uh, why the rates of infant mortality are high uh, currently and wh what's that about and, and what direction are people, are providers heading to, to curb that? Yes, absolutely. One of it is internal biases, racism within the constructs of medical care. Um, yeah, a lot of that. Um, some organizations are doing these healthcare like packages to where they're putting together, okay, how can we better serve those that might have um, hypertension before pregnancy or hypertension during pregnancy? How can we prevent preeclampsia? What about postpartum hemorrhaging? All the preventable things, because a lot of probably half of the mortality rates could be um, impacted by these preventable things. Um, and sometimes just listening to women. Um, that irks me more than anything is when, um, you know, you can't possibly know what's going on here, but you're having a baby. This is the first time you've done this. You can't possibly be ready to have your baby. And they finally take heed and like, oh yeah, your baby's coming out. It's like, well, I tried to tell you that, but you weren't listening. Um, we all heard in the news not too long ago about Serena Williams and her experience in childbirth. And she nearly died from a blood clot that she was aware of that nobody would listen to her about. She knew what the signs and symptoms were. She had suffered from them before and no one would listen to her. Some of that is insurance care too, because, oh, well, your insurance isn't gonna cover that. Or this like, so what? Who cares if insurance covers it? Do it. If it is the process of elimination that we need to provide this person with appropriate care, then we need to do it. Um, some of it I think is our practices in maternal health care too, of the, the five, 10 minute cattle call type appointments and nobody's really listening and asking the questions. Um, this is maternal mental health week um, across the world. And part of that is um, what are we doing for women during their pregnancy and postpartum about their maternal mental health? Um, it's not just about postpartum depression. Um, there's perinatal depression, anxiety, OCD, um, things that are being left untreated and women are suffering in silence because they have no idea what this is and they think they're a bad mom because they're having intrusive thoughts. It's like, no, these are symptoms of something that you can get help with. Um, so a lot of it is that too, and just not having the discussions and our postpartum follow-up in America is awful. Um, as midwives, we are usually back with our clients at 24 to 48 hours, um, one week, three weeks, six weeks. Usually when you have a baby in the hospital, we'll see you in six weeks. Sometimes two, if you've had a cesarean, just to check on that. Um, but if you feel like you have a problem, you have to call and sometimes you have to go through a nurse, that may be inundated with other phone calls and stuff. And it might be a day or two before they get back to you. In the meantime, you know, you're suffering from who knows what um, that could have potentially been a preventable thing. That's my take on what our society is doing wrong kind of thing. <laughs> 